Hello, everybody who's joining. All right, that's my alarm. All right, so if you're watching this live, hi, hey, Lynn. Cool, I appreciate it. So if you're here live, I do have the presentation link at the very top of the chat. If you are not here live, that's okay. If you're watching this after the fact on the recording, here's how you can reach the resources. You just simply go to myname.com and then go to presentations. And then right now it's at the very top. But when you watch this in the recording, there might be some more. So more presentations coming up over this summer. Okay, so what's the plan for this particular session? So very quickly, I'll just kind of give some context to who I am. We'll talk a little bit about beyond a digital divide, moving beyond one. Then I'll explain, well, what do I mean by uh, engineered inequality? And we'll talk about how we might rethink our relationship to CS and technology. And then we'll actually explore some resources and examples. There's actually several hours worth of content that are linked here and in the link that's in the chat. So we don't have enough time to, to go through it all in the hour. So I'm going to be going through some stuff quickly, but then providing resources um, to dive deeper in your own free time. OK, I want to provide a little bit of a framing for this particular session. And interestingly enough, we're going to use TikTok to do that. So let's listen to this. I talk about privilege a lot on my page, and Hopefully that tends to piss off a lot of white men. I've said before that the target of social justice movements is not men. It is misogyny, sexism, and the patriarchy. The target is not white people, it is white supremacy. But then I get a lot of questions from primarily white men asking me if they are not the target of these movements, then why are they the subject of discussion of a lot of my content? And I have a little analogy that might help you all understand this. So our society is made of primarily right-handed people. We are the majority. So our system is designed for right-handed people. The products designed by companies are designed primarily for right-handed people. If you're right-handed, you might have never noticed this, but if you're left-handed, I'm sure that you have. And so whenever you go to school or go to work, things like scissors are provided for right-handed people without considering the needs of left-handed people. Now, imagine if left-handed people started talking about the system which provides disadvantages for them because they are not kept in mind when the system is designed. So their frustrations are aimed at the system. It is aimed at the companies who are perpetuating this injustice. But now imagine if right-handed people decided to say, mm, I don't see the problem. The system works fine. I've never noticed the issues that you're discussing, so I don't find them worthy of discussion. You can imagine how the conversation that left-handed people are having is going to now be directed towards that segment of right-handed people. Although their main frustration is towards the system and towards the companies, you become subject of discussion when you decide to take an active role in protecting and defending these oppressive systems. So you just have to ask yourself, am I listening? Am I trying to expand my perspective? And although I might not understand the system is designed for me, am I deciding to take an active role in dismantling an oppressive system and creating equality for everyone? Or am I trying to silence those trying to do so? And in doing that, am I actively protecting and defending an oppressive system, therefore becoming the subject of discussion? Okay, so the reason why I'm sharing this is because I want to discuss a topic that is, tends to be politically charged at times and know that I'm not intending to attack anyone or anything that has worked well for you as an individual, but to highlight some areas of some things that we should actually talk about more as a field or as educators. So that's the intent. Feel free to ask some questions in the chat and um, there should be time at the end as well, as long as I don't talk too slow. Okay, so very quick context. So I've worked with all grades, kindergarten through doctoral students in a variety of contexts. I have experience as both a music educator and a computer science educator. You'll see why that's important a little bit later. I'm currently the Director of Education and Research at Boot Up Professional Development. And if you want to learn more about my background, there's a link to my CV here, and it's on my website. So if that stuff's important to you, feel free to check it out. Okay, so... Often what has been discussed in CS and technology education has like kind of framed things around a digital divide. 
So when I previously worked in a district where we had mandated K-8 technology specials that became coding classes for the entire district. So rather than teaching like office suites and things like that, we helped kids learn how to code. And so they would learn in a variety of platforms, different languages, etc. Now, a question for you is, would you consider this to be equitable? And then another question might be, Okay, but does this actually close the digital divide? And my very firm answer on this is maybe. So it, for me, it's not just about getting devices into the hands of kids and requiring participation in CS. So for example, what if I told you that one school had an hour every single day set aside to computer science where they was dedicated to it. And then another school may do like a hour of code once a semester, like some kind of a, an event with like families and things like that. They're both doing computer science. They both have access to it, but it's not very um, equity centered when it comes to or equitable in terms of how it's being implemented in the approaches. So not only do we need to talk about some of the inequalities that go on with like hardware and software, but we also need to talk about some of the inequalities with like the design or with like the pedagogies and the content that is used in the context as well. So that's what we're going to kind of explore a bit today. So what is engineered inequality? So I've got some examples for you here. So one of them is actually builds off of what was just discussed with like the left-handed and right-handed. So we're going to watch a short video real quick. Scissors are the item most commonly referred to as difficult to use by left-handers of all ages. And they're a perfect example of a totally right-handed design which becomes extremely inefficient and uncomfortable when used in the left hand. But why all the fuss? Why don't left-handers just use their right hand for cutting out? The reason is that cutting, like writing, is a fine motor skill, and most left-handers do not have the necessary control in their right hand. Using right-handed scissors in your left hand is not the answer either, as they just do not cut properly. Using them in the wrong hand forces the blades apart rather than together, so we squeeze them more tightly, leading to a sore thumb knuckle and an aching hand. You can see from this pair of right-handed scissors that the right blade is always on top and the blades are set so that the action of squeezing with the right hand pushes the blades together, giving a good clean cut. But when we put the same right-handed scissors in the left hand, you will immediately see that the top blade now obscures the cutting line, so you cannot see what you're cutting. To overcome this problem, left-handers have to angle the scissors to peer over the top of the blades or cut shapes backwards, starting at the front of a circle and cutting anti-clockwise around it. And you can see how awkward it looks. Very quickly, another problem becomes apparent. Using a right-handed scissor in the left hand means you're pushing the blades apart rather than together, so the paper bends and tears rather than cutting smoothly. To try and make the scissors work, left-handers have to push the thumb and index finger together in an unnatural way to make the scissors cut causing marks on the hand and eventually calluses. <laughs> yeah, so Lynn, I'm I'm right-handed, so I had no idea this was a thing. And then when I saw a video like this and somebody talking about it, I was like, Should this genius no way. And so I went and tried it out and I was like, oh, wow, I had no idea. And then the next video that we're going to watch, I had no idea that this was also a thing because I have a ghostly white complexion. Mm. Nice. Okay, Noel, you try it out. One to your honey. Two black or two black. black. Yeah. What I'll Come do again. Uh, Come again, Sash. Uh, 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 what I'll do to get to the get to yeah, get to yeah. the yeah. yeah. well, what do you have to do? That's how racial this thing is. Yeah. Put some that piece of white. Is that napkin? I'm sure it is. Napkin again. Pay up the pin again. Napkin again. Right, pay up. What's it called on the hand? <laughs> man, black man, game fight, black man, game fight, all over, all over. So I had no idea that there was inequalities designed into scissors and designed into soap dispensers, etc. Now, inequalities and like different barriers to use and and whatnot exist in a variety of technologies. So there's a short article if you want to learn more about how there's inequalities and in bias in facial recognition technologies. And then if you want to get into algorithmic bias, check out this longer article or an entire book about like algorithms in relation to racism and whatnot. So I highly recommend checking out these particular resources. But again, we don't have 
a lot of time to explore them today. What we're going to do is actually going to use a framework. This is not an equity framework, but it's a framework for kind of like understanding how to use like technology or even CS in a classroom context. So it's called TPAC. This framework, we have technology, that's the T. The P is pedagogical knowledge, and then C is the content knowledge. And the A is just kind of there to make it look fancier than it actually is. So again, this is not an equity framework. But what I'm going to do is kind of like use this as a lens to apply it to a domain that is something that I've been very passionate about for years. So it's actually drumline. What I'm then going to do is hopefully when we've kind of like unpacked some of the problems with something that might be a little more foreign um, to CS educators, then we're going to actually take it and apply it to CS education. So don't worry, this is not all about like drumline and whatnot. Okay. So... I have a kind of an, an interesting relationship with Drumline. It literally kept me alive for many years because I was severely depressed and suicidal for high school and undergrad. And the one activity that I really loved was engaging in Drumline. Even though I'm very passionate about it, had a great time with it mostly, there are some problems with it. I'm going to unpack it. And then I'm going to ask that we do the same thing with CS education. I love computer science, but there's also some problems that we need to kind of like work on. So one thing that you'll notice, if you do a search for DCI or WGI drum lines in an image search, you'll most likely find something like this. It might be a little hard to see, but if you zoom in on your own version using the, the PDF, you'll see that most of them appear as white males. They might be non-binary individuals as myself, but the majority of people who tend to march fit within that demographic. Now, one of the reasons why people look very similar on these images is because the design of the hardware used by drumlines around the world was designed for certain body types and not for others. So for example, this is a picture of myself with hair and with the hardware that I'm using has crossbars, two of them, one on the chest and one on the hip. This makes it very difficult for people who have breasts to actually be able to march with and people who have larger hips to be able to march with. So this is one of the many reasons why you will see many people who look like myself marching on drumline and not people who don't look like myself in this particular activity. Now that, by the way, is like the T. That's the technology of TPAC for thinking of that. Now, if we focus on the P of TPAC, many of the pedagogies used in ensembles like these are military-like. So to the point where some of the experiences that I had as a musician, I would say that the instructors were downright abusive in terms of how they were treating um, some of the members of the, the, the drum lines. So these types of pedagogies that are kind of pervasive amongst the activity can filter many people out. So many people look at that and go, I don't want to do that. I like the drumming aspect, but I don't like how it's being taught. Now, by the way, in case you're wondering why I'm sharing this particular picture, it's because it makes me laugh. This is a yearbook picture. I try to make the most awkward face I can, and I think I succeeded in that. So, so that was the T, the P. Now we're going to talk about the C, so the content. So another reason why the pictures have similar looking demographics is because of the content being taught. So although many people assume a music class is all about creating like expressions through sound and it can be highly recreative because you lack autonomy when um, the pedagogies are being used or in a particular style. So for example, on the screen is some snare music that I wrote for a drum line that I used to teach. And there is literally only one way that you can play this part correctly, and you have to play it the same way as everybody else on the line. I think there were five or six uh, snare drummers on the line at the time. If one of those five or six students did not play it the exact same way as everybody else, then the judge would score you lower. So this makes it very inaccessible in terms of the like who can actually participate and actually play the material that was written by myself for this particular drum line. So again, even though I'm very passionate about this particular activity, had a lot of great experiences with it, there's some problems that lead to some of the issues that we saw in the picture and then I'll show um, in a moment. If we look at TPAC, again, this is a framework where we can see that there are some inequalities that exist in the design of the technology. There's some inequalities in terms of the content and in, in like the, the music itself and then in the pedagogy, which is why it leads to many different pictures where it it's basically the same kinds of people making the same kinds of music in this particular activity. But now that I problematized some of the engineered inequalities in a relatively distant domain, what I want to do now is actually highlight how some of the inequalities engineered into drumline are also present in CS education. Okay, 
So the, if we think back to the previous video about the scissors, it demonstrates how common tools used in the classroom can act as forms of engineered inequalities. So for example, many block-based coding environments are inaccessible for people who have vision impairments. So if you think of like Scratch, it is largely media-based, story-based, games, etc., and it is not very um, accessible to people who are, are, are hard of sight or are blind. Now, just like with Drumline, it's not only the technology that we use that has inequalities engineered in them. It's also the kinds of like educational experiences offered within a classroom that can have unintentionally um, created some inequalities simply because the kids are interested in are uninterested in learning the experiences that are being offered to them that they're being asked to engage with. So, for example. The technology being used on this screen has one correct way of using it. This can lead to some inequalities in terms of the things that you create with the technology and who would be interested in such a limited type of engagement. While some people have made statements such as like, don't just play on your phone, program it. The idea can imply that coding can be very creative process. And I agree, it can. However, when kids are engaging in puzzle-based platforms that have one correct solution, there is very little creativity involved, and the problems being solved might not be of interest to the kids solving them, which might cause some kids to actually lose interest in a topic or subject simply because of the content and pedagogies being used in that particular environment. So, for example, this one, it says that there are two blocks already here, the win, run, move forward, and you need to add two more into it. Okay, so in order to solve this correctly, to get four out of four blocks, you have to only use two more move forwards one way to solve that. That might be a fun game for kids, and for other kids, it might be boring. So I've had some kids who would do puzzle-based stuff when they chose to do it. They would get bored with it after a couple of weeks of coming back to it, and they're like, okay, it's basically the same thing over and over. What they instead preferred to do was like work on a project that was individually meaningful to them, like a game or a story or an animation or something. And there are many different platforms that are more conducive to that. So some people like myself have kind of moved away from the puzzle-based uh, uh, platforms. And it's no disrespect to those platforms. They have a great purpose and, and do it very well. Um, and instead move more towards project-based or arts-based coding, which um, is what I have tended to do and would recommend. However, this can lead to some interesting and problematic um, discussions around integration and curriculum and content and whatnot. So I've actually included three different podcasts. I'd recommend listening to them in order. So first this one, then this one, then that one. And this talks about some of the problems with integration, especially in relation to subservient types of in integration. So if we think of like integrating music and computer science, there is a way that you could do it so that music is subservient to computer science, where it's like the only purpose of using music is to like increase enrollment numbers and engagement. And then vice versa, like the only purpose of using computer science might be related to music. So that would be subservient. I talk about it much more in these podcasts. It's like an hour and a half worth of content. So if you want a, a deeper dive into why it's problematic and what are some alternatives to that problematic form of integration, check those out. And then if you're interested in like the music and CS intersections, there's two podcasts that kind of talk about that as well. But I don't want to dwell on it too much. Quick data points on the music and CS or on the integration as um, in particular. I don't know if there's a delay in the chat. OK. So. Oh, and Lynn, just to clarify, the first when you say the integration, the first on here or the first one that I said, which was music, I said it backwards, <laughs> which is why I want to make sure I clarify. Okay, so each one of these... Um, I think it has some show notes in it, but let me pull them up. So for this one, this is a Bressler article. So this is talking about arts integration. And so in this particular article, it talks about three different types um, 
mainly three different types, subservient, co-equal, and effective. And then there's also the social, but that one's kind of less used. But the co-equal status is making it so that like both domains are serving each other in ways that are beneficial to each other. So if it's music and CS, it's like with the two ampersands. So it's saying you have to have both in order to make it true. So that article kind of talks about that in the podcast. But then I talk about in the images of curriculum, some different types of um, curriculum to think through. So this talks about how there are different approaches that can be used. Like a, a curriculum could be curriculum as like a set of lesson plans, or it could be curriculum as um, social reconstruction. So like the stuff that comes out of like the KPOR Center, that um, the content that they are developing and that framework is an example of social reconstruction, in my opinion. So creating curriculum for the purpose of improving society. But another one might be to actually like follow social norms. So to teach people like how to be a good citizen in the US. That's an idea of curriculum. Another one is curriculum as career, which is like visioning curriculum as like a, a journey of self-reflection of past understandings in relation to current understandings while looking forward into the future, which I know is like a, a weird way of phrasing it, but I talk about it more in the podcast. That's kind of how I used the um, curriculum and the content that I created for the classes that I worked with. And so when we have a discussion on integration, it's important to know not only the different types of integration, but what do you mean by curriculum? Is the point for social reconstruction? Is the point for a journey through education? Is the point for just learning a set of concepts and practices disconnected from social justice? which my guess is that 40% of educators who do not think that um, social justice topics should be in the CS classroom probably fit into that category. So that helps give a better understanding of, well, what are some different types of curriculum and how are people conceiving of it? And then this last one um, just kind of like unpacks some like other ways uh, that you can actually explore curriculum content um, on there. So there are three very nerdy approaches, but like each one of them builds off of each other. And then I talk in this last particular episode why it's important to have a conversation about all three different things in terms of, well, what is curriculum? What's the purpose of it? How are we going to integrate, et cetera, before actually saying we're going to integrate? Because like when working with different districts, there's a tendency where they're like, oh, well, we don't have a lot of time, so we're just going to integrate it into the school day. And they don't necessarily think of, well, what positive and negative impact is that going to have when you integrate it with the other subject area? Because it's forcing you to focus on the, like if we have a Venn diagram, it forces you to focus on where it connects while ignoring everything that's outside of that. And so that's a as quick of an overview as I can. But again, this is like an hour and a half worth of um, podcasts that I recommend checking out. So you're welcome. Man. Thank you for asking the question. Um, okay. So the point that I'm getting at here is basically, hey, we need to focus not just on the inequalities with technology in terms of like the design, like accessibility, things like that. We also need to talk about inequalities in the content. So if we had a computer science curriculum where all of the imagery had like white males in it, that would be problematic to not have diverse representation of different people who actually engage with computer science. So that's an area in content. But then when it comes to pedagogy, it's like, well, how are you implementing it? Are you are you teaching it in a way where everybody's doing the same thing? That might not be culturally relevant to a diverse set of kids, et cetera. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit more. Um, oops, and I just went over that. So again, TPAC is not a framework for equitable equi equity, but it is a way that we can look at this and go, okay, if one of these areas is not equitable, how could we, one, kind of like change that? And then two, how might we overcompensate in some other areas to kind of make up for it? Like, oh, if the content we're using isn't very equitable, maybe we can and change our pedagogy to make it more equitable by like asking some more questions that are actually relevant to the kids that we're working with. So if you have a mandated curriculum, this is one way that you can do it. Focus more on the pedagogy and the technologies you use if the content knowledge is something you can't change, which was the case in one of the districts that I worked in previously. There are other more useful um, frameworks to consider if you are interested in, in this in particular. So like if you want to talk about accessibility, I'd highly recommend checking out understanding, um, oops, not understanding by design, universal design for learning. 
understanding my design is project-based learning stuff. And then also, if you're interested in more um, culturally relevant, check out the k Center's Culturally Responsive Sustaining Framework. I think that's the full title for it. And so this is an actual link to it. Any of the images on the presentation slides, if you click on it, it'll take you to there so you can actually read more about it. OK. So now that I've kind of very quickly presented a problem, what I want to do is kind of talk about some different ways that we might actually rethink our relation to, relationship to technology and computer science education. So let's explore pedagogy and even technology a little bit in these two images. So on the left, we have an example of a close-ended use of a paintbrush. And we'll consider that to be technology in this case. So on the left, we have a bunch of trees. They're using the same color palette. We have a grid in the background. We have one tree with a similar number of branches, all going out to about the same distance. It has like these little little orbs around it, same colors, etc. So this is one way that people are using technology that aligns with a particular pedagogy that's making it so that if this was a class with 30 kids, you would have 30 of the exact same trees coming out of this. But another way, if you were to simply use the same technology, but try and use a different pedagogical approach, you could actually get into some different content. So let's say all of these are all paintings, and this is also an art wall uh, for a different classroom. In this one, we see a hot air balloon. We see some people. We see maybe that person's house. We see all sorts of different artistic styles, different forms of expression, representation, etc in this particular form of art walk, which is just taking the same idea, we're gonna learn concepts and learn technology, and then we're going to apply a different pedagogy to make it so that we have varied outcomes and whatnot. Um, reading through the comment real quick. Yes, I totally agree with you, Lynn, and if anybody who's unable to see it, the idea of using like images, different kind of um, representation of people for sound, imagery, etc., to talk about different identities and different ways of being, whether it's like race or gender, socioeconomic status, etc. I think it is very important. But as you mentioned, yes, this requires a deep understanding of equitable approaches. And I would argue that if we do like a webinar or a one-off workshop or like uh, what a lot of districts will end up doing, like we're going to have our like equity webinar. That's not enough. Like you can get entire graduate degrees in equity related um, education frameworks and still not be enough. Like having taken multiple classes on it, I'm still learning constantly. So it really is like a deep commitment, in my opinion, from like the school or the district to make sure that all teachers are doing that. And then for, as a field, I think we need to have a deep commitment towards it. But that does align, um, depending on how you do it, to the um, curriculum of social reconstruction. I think that was the phrasing of that in the um, Images of Curriculum podcast. So check that one out for a little bit more on that. OK. So if we, going back to the technology, if we keep the same technology, change the pedagogy, we can have a very different result on um, this art walk. But if we think of this in relation to computer science, like when I had kids all using puzzle-based versus project-based in Scratch or Sonic Pi or Khan Academy or Xcode in my class, that's kind of what this looked like. However, if we take it one step further and move beyond just all using the same technology, we could get art walks that look like this. So many different forms of expression, many different media or mediums to explore. Like you could do ceramics, you could do paper mache, you could do uh, textiles or e-textiles, you could do drawings, paintings, all sorts of different stuff. So if we think of what might a CS education experience look like if this were the outcome as like a metaphor, for myself, it was, OK, you can explore like Arduinos. You can explore like the different platforms that I mentioned, different programming languages, et cetera, to create games or stories, animations, music, all sorts of really interesting stuff. So that requires a change in not just the content and the pedagogy, but the technologies, like the languages and platforms that you end up using. This is a very different approach that is kind of um, doesn't work well, in my opinion, with sequential design. So sequential design is like if we everybody in the class is going to go um, from step one to two to three in the same order, roughly at the same pace, or maybe in a self-paced environment if you're able to do that. 
An alternative approach, however, is to use a design or a pedagogical approach called rhizomatic learning. So think of each one of these particular nodes on here as a different computer science concept, a practice, a standard, or maybe even a different project. Rather than everybody starting on, like, let's say this one, and then all going to this one, and then going in a similar path, if you had 30 kids in a class, they could work, start on 30 different nodes and then head in 30 different directions should they want to do that. This requires a whole lot more upfront work in terms of like how I designed resources to support the kids that I work with. And then how I facilitated was actually just going one on one, walking around the room constantly and checking in on kids as they were working on their different concepts, practices, projects, etc. throughout the class. This is a very um, unique way of approaching education, but it's a lot of fun, in my opinion, for the kids. And then for myself, as somebody who facilitated it and as somebody who also previously facilitated the sequential design, I much rather prefer this because as a student, I enjoy being able to create things that are interesting to me. And then as somebody who was facilitating and designing this stuff, it was just much more exciting to see 30 different projects that kids were engaging with rather than everybody like recreating the exact same thing or solving the same puzzle or project or whatever. Now, if you get into this and you want to like zoom out away from not just the pedagogy, but also think of the silos that kind of exist within education, you can also start to break those down. So for example, in my dissertation, I found a lot of interconnected practices. So for it, I looked at a discussion forum that had over, over 10,000 people responding um, to discussion forum posts. And so this was for chip music, which is people who make music with old like um, video game hardware and like computers. So like we're talking like the Nintendo or an Atari, things like that, like anything that had a really old sound chip. These people get on this discussion forum and then share what they were doing. When I analyzed it, it was like 11 million words of data and found different interconnected practices that related to music. So people who were engaging in this engaged in music composition, they would perform, they would talk about maker practices, which were like hardware manufacturing and designing. They would also talk about coding practices. They would also talk about how to sell their different merchandise and whatnot, like their albums, visual art, and then some community practices in terms of like how they were engaging with and collaborating with each other. All of these were interconnected. So it wasn't like, okay, everybody who wants to talk about composing, you're going to go into this forum and just talk about composing and you don't engage in anything else. If anything, what you would find is people bouncing back and forth between all these different things. So if we use this again as a metaphor and apply it into CS education, we could look at CS education and go, wait a minute, why do we have to only engage with programming? Why can we also, why can we not also engage in some other forms of um, concepts and practices that are related to computer science education that exist outside of, of programming or whatever it is that you're interested in, like cybersecurity or networking or whatever. So if you're interested in it, there's more discussion about this in that particular link on there. But another thing that if we zoom out again, look at the design of the classroom itself, the way that I structured my class in terms of how the space was set up and the ways that I facilitated it was based off of some research and literature by James Paul G. So James Paul G coined the term affinity spaces, and it's kind of like a, a response to communities of, of practice by Laban Wenger. And so it's specifically focusing on more informal types of learning, although it can be applied in formalized spaces as I did. If you want to hear more about how I actually applied these like informal characteristics of learning into a space that I um, designed and facilitated, I have a whole podcast on it. I think it's like 30 plus minutes, or you can read the actual chapter itself. Excuse me. And if you don't have access to the chapter, there is a contact me button on my website. So hint, hint, feel free to reach out um, if you don't want to pay for the chapter that is in a handbook. Okay, now I want to talk about some music technology examples. And you might be like, well, why are we focusing on this? My, my hope is that you will look at this as a springboard for other ideas that you can use in computer science education. All of these heavily related to computer science, but think beyond just music. I just want to provide these contexts, just kind of have a, a nice through line for this particular session. So we're going to watch two short videos and then an excerpt from a little bit of a longer video. So 
here's a video that I'll kind of narrate out loud. This person took a typewriter and they turned it into a MIDI device, which allowed them to make music. Here's what it sounds like. And then here's the MIDI. They're doing drumming. Okay, so if you look at this, we see we've got a bunch of different wires going into a breadboard. Looks like it's mounted onto the side. And my guess is it's going into like a Teensy or an Arduino or something. And then that's going into the computer, which is then likely plugged into something like Ableton Live, which is the software. So if we think of the typewriter as like an inequality or a barrier or something, in this case, it happens to be you're unable to make music with it. Okay, well, this person found a workaround with it. So they took something that is existing and they modified it to do something new. That is an approach that we can use with the technologies that we use if there's like accessibility issues or equity issues related to the technology. But we can also create new technologies like this very simple example or set of simple examples of kids who were using Scratch and little like robots to program some music making devices. Like this first one is basically like recreating like a drumstick to be able to play the drum rhythmically. Uh, there's my mouse. There <laughs> Okay, so again, although this is music technology, if we think of this in relation to like accessibility, equity, if there is a gap of something where we are unable to do something in the field or with the classes that we work with, then maybe as a class, we can pose that as a potential problem to explore and try and solve. So that is an option for you as well. In this case, it might be, well, I've got a bunch of Legos and I wanna make music with it. I got maybe, I don't know, drums in your room or something. How can we make it so that we can make music with this? Instead of focusing around music, if you focus it around equity, accessibility, et cetera, then we can actually start to address some of the issues that um, we could solve through computer science concepts and practices. Now I've got one more. This is a longer video. I'm gonna show you a portion of it, but I'll narrate it. Um, well, I'll give you some context. Okay, so this person basically created what I would consider to be like saxophone 2.0. So this is taking things to a whole nother level where they are designing, manufacturing, and coding things to be able to create music. So instead of just trying to modify something or create something small, we could actually start to partner with larger organizations and other individuals to actually create something more powerful or more meaning to actually solve some of the issues that are going on. So here is an example of that in music technology. But again, think about it in relation to CS and inequalities. To show you the, the instrument that I design to the music that I create. My music is called Beat Jazz. And this is my Beat Jazz controller. It's a three way wireless network uh, built on open source software, running an open source operating system. I use it to create a style that's completely improvised uh, using nothing but synthesizers and these. I needed a controller that allowed me to improvise in multiple dimensions. So I created a controller that's based on saxophone fingerings but has accelerometers that uh, allow me to control multiple different effects and uh, parameters at once using different key commands. So I'm able to create everything live and have it with the you know, sound like a, like a DJ set.
Now I'm going to go ahead and pause it there. I do recommend checking out the rest of it. So the controller that he's using right here, it's pressure sensitive. So you're able to change the pitch by how much you are pressing on it, which is something that you can't really do on saxophone, at least not to that extent. He's also got some different joysticks for his thumb. He's got the, the accelerometers and whatnot, so you can actually change and literally shape the sound depending on where he moves his hands in relation to it. And then he's got the device that he's got on his forearm and whatnot. So this is taking things to a whole nother level beyond like the original design um, at, for the instruments that he plays, like cl uh, clarinet, saxophone, etc. So as a wind player. So what I'm encouraging us to do in this particular session is to like rethink Okay, well, what exactly could we do to address some of the inequalities that do currently exist or some of the accessibility issues? There are some more examples on here, like there's a um, hardware practices. It's also linked in the link that is pinned at the top. So thank you, Lynn, for doing that. And then here's a playlist with like 34 more if you want on there. Um, the appendix in the dissertation kind of shows some examples of some images of how people modified things to be able to create new music with it so by like adding in different ports and things like that so if you're interested in that check that out and that'll allow you to nerd out on it okay let me go to the next slide so what i'm hoping we can do um i wanted to make sure we got through this with enough time to be able to like answer some questions and and whatnot because again there's more resources than we have time for but I want to give you some time to explore the resources on this page. I'll give you a very quick overview of everything you can find on here. If you want more music inspiration ideas of, that are related to um, hardware in particular, modifications and computer science, check out this playlist. But if you want to learn more about the rhizomatic learning, specifically like that approach of making it so if you have 30 kids in the room, they have like 30 different projects that they're working on at their own pace, et cetera. This playlist right here, has a few different examples. Um, some are lectures, and this first one, excuse me, is a panel discussion with Catherine Bornhurst, John Stapleton, and Katie Henry that talks about well, what is rhizomatic learning, and what does that look like in computer science education in particular. The remaining stuff on here, like some of them are like short presentations that I've done or stuff by um, Dave Cormier. And they they have um, a variety of lectures on what this looks like, specifically in like higher ed. But the this first podcast talks about in like the K twelve context. So I'd recommend checking that out. There's also some more presentations on here that kind of like unpack well what does this look like, and then there are some publications. So the first one that's related to the rhizomatic learning is the affinity space one that I mentioned. And again, there's a podcast episode. There's another one that specifically talks about how to engage in rhizomatic practices in ways that are focused on intersectional identities and how you can foster them. So check this one out. It is available for free. So if you actually go here and then you click on here, it takes you to the PDF. It's only four pages, so it's really short. And then there's another short like practitioner article. There are some other things, uh, other publications by some other individuals on rhizomatic learning. But all of this might be a little um, foreign or intimidating for some administrators. So I wanted to share an, a resource where I shared this with my administrators. We use the TAP evaluation. It's like the teacher evaluation um, program in our district. And so what I did was I took the original verbiage of like the, the TAP language and then translated it into, okay, well, here's what it would actually look like in the CS and coding classes that I was teaching. And then I kind of explained, well, what's similar and what's different. And so I did this for every single one of the indicators on here. So what I'd recommend, if you start doing this approach and you start shifting your pedagogy and your content and the technology that you're using to more equitable and accessible approaches, if it starts to deviate away from what admin are comfortable with, maybe collaboratively kind of coming up with, well, what might this look like in relation to like your evaluation thing or whatever? just made it easier for my um, principal and assistant principal to come in and go, okay, what should I expect? How does this relate? And then this just kind of translates it into there. So you can share something like that. And then there are a bunch more resources at the very bottom. Um, like, for example, some more articles that are relevant. And then podcast episode, there's like 140 some odd episodes on there. So if you want to focus on episodes related to like disability or equity or whatever, you can click on those. And if you just click on this very last one, it takes you to the landing page that has all 
140 some odd episodes on there. Okay. That was a lot. I'll try to get through it at a relatively quick pace. So that way there was time for you to explore at the end and then hopefully be able to talk about like these three questions in particular. Let me make it a little bit bigger, easier to see. So if anyone is still awake and not asleep, if you have questions about anything that I just shared, please feel free to post it in the chat or please feel free to ask to join on the stage and uh, ask me through your mic or video and mic. I'm happy to chat. Otherwise, we can all just look through the resources and I can twiddle my thumbs. Slowly or fast. Need some water. Why is rhizomatic, is rhizomatic learning important for you? There is no one right way to learning, and it certainly is not linear. Mm -hmm. So for me, the reason why I focus on rhizomatic approaches is because I'm trying to model the kinds of learning that students would be doing outside of the classroom. So I'd frequently have kids work on a project, and they'd run into a bug. I'd walk up to them and like, use a series of guiding questions to kind of help them figure out what the bug is, even though I like could sometimes immediately know, oh, they forgot X, Y, or Z, like a semicolon or something. Students would sometimes be like, why don't you just tell me that? Like after like five minutes of guiding them through it. And my response was always, what would you have done if I was not here? So if you're at home working on this, or if there's a substitute or something, how would you have figured out how to do that? And so I was trying to model different ways of thinking and learning. When it comes to a rhizomatic approach where you're able to work on anything you want, you don't have things handed to you sequentially. It's much more of like what I do as an adult when I'm like picking up a hobby or learning something new. Like I'm very slowly learning Japanese and I don't have a course on that. I'm trying to figure out how do I learn from? Is Duolingo a good app or should I use Lingo Deer? Or maybe I should like sign up for something else. Or maybe I should just like read manga or like watch a bunch of YouTube videos, etc. There are many ways to do that. And so for me to be able to figure out what resources are going to be helpful and for me in that particular moment, it's very useful. But the rhizomatic approach from an equity-centered um, standpoint, it makes it so that instead of going with what like the educator or the teacher is like really passionate about, have like everybody all do the exact same thing, it's instead going with what each individual is passionate about. So for people who are watching this, I am clearly passionate about music and computer science. So if I taught an entire course that was just on that intersection, that would be really cool to me, but maybe not for people who are required to be there. So because most of my teaching experience has been in the K-8 space, in mandatory classes that people are not electing to attend, but are in fact required to attend, I have to approach that very differently than like the undergrad and graduate courses that I would taught where people are paying and choosing to attend those kinds of classes. So the rhizomatic approach accounts for the fact that not everyone cares about computer science or about whatever subject area and instead can focus on the things they do care about and explore that with computer science, kind of like as a medium for that exploration or expression which would be very different than like how I've facilitated classes where like people are paying to be there because I know they want to be there, like on how to develop skills and expertise in musicianship. Like that is a graduate class that I know people want to attend because they're electing to do that. It's not required. Rhizomatic learning just happens to be like the approach that I think best aligns with like the mandatory classes and whatnot that accounts for many ways of learning. But there are some problems with it in terms of um, it's harder, especially if you're trying to assess things and everybody's at a different, different place. But that is also kind of is just more real world because I've never had a class where everybody's at the exact same understanding as everybody else in it. So Lynn, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the question. I'm going to drink more water. I'm very thirsty today.
You're very welcome. What about other questions or concerns or complaints? I talk about it in some of the other presentations on the website. Um, let's see if I can find one real quick. Hmm. I don't see it on there. There's another one that I did on rhizomatic learning. Here, let's do that. A while ago, where I kind of talk about the pros and cons. No, not that one. Okay. I don't remember which presentation it was, but it basically had like a chart where it talked about like, here's some good, here's some bad for both sequential and rhizomatic approaches. anyone has any questions about any of the resources that were shared, please feel free to let me know. And if, because I provided several hours worth of content, if down the road, would you get, I don't know, three hours into it, you're like, oh, I have a question. There's a contact me button on my website. And then you can just let me know that you're not a robot by clicking on pictures. And then I'll be happy to respond there. Cool. Thanks for joining, Lynn. And anyone else who is here? I'm assuming you're looking at the resources. But I'm here for you. You are welcome, Helen. You are welcome, Tony. Thank you for attending. I'm going to go ahead and scroll up to this slide, just in case anybody who's watching the recording after the fact doesn't want to rewind to find how to get here. That's the link. MyName.com. Presentations. Title. All right, and it looks like it is about 12 o'clock here.
which I believe is the end of the session. So thank you for everybody who attended. I hope you all have a great rest of the conference. And anyone who's watching this after for that, after the fact, again, contact me button on my website. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat with you. But I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And uh, I will talk to you later.